We start the meditation every evening with thoughts of goodwill for the entire world. So why are we sitting here with our eyes closed? Why aren't we out there helping the world? Well, we're sitting here with our eyes closed, helping the world. Because everyone in the world wants happiness. Everyone in the world wants well-being. And for the most part, we're looking for our well-being and the pleasures of the senses. And as the Buddha points out, there's never a sense of enough with those pleasures. He said you could have it rain gold coins, and it still wouldn't be enough to provide for one's, one person's sensual desires. Another place the Buddha said you could have two mountains the size of the Himalayas all made of gold, and still it wouldn't be enough to satisfy people's sensual, sensual desires. There's never the word enough out there no matter how much you help people in that area. It never comes to an end. And then, of course, there's your quest for sinful pleasures, too. And here is where the meditation comes in. The Buddha speaks of the pleasure of concentration as a way of pulling yourself away from your sensual desires, your lust, your greed. The things that create trouble in the world. Because wherever you go, looking for something, somebody else has already laid claim to it, which means you have to fight other people off to gain those pleasures. And when they come, they just slip through your fingers like water. And John Swap would often say, Your sensual pleasures from last week, where are they now? There may be a memory of some of them. Most of them you've forgotten. And even ones that you can remember. It's not necessarily a good memory. Either you get wistful for the pleasures that have gone, or you can think about the unskillful things you did to gain those pleasures. It's because of our thirst for sensual pleasures that there are fights within a family, fights between families fights between nations. So the ability to find an alternative source of pleasure is actually a moral act, a particular source of pleasure that doesn't have to take anything away from anyone else, which is what we're doing right here, trying to develop the potentials we have for pleasure within the body, within the mind, here in the present moment. We work with the breath because of all the elements in the body, all the properties in the body. That's the easiest to manipulate. You can think of breathing in long, and the body will breathe in long. You can think short, and the body will take a short breath. And you can ask yourself what kind of breathing would feel really good right now. This is where it's important to develop your sensitivities, because all too often we've learned to be insensitive to the needs of the body, especially its breath needs. We push the breath energies around in line with our emotions. And so in the very beginning, it's as if the body is a little bit leery of the attention we're paying to it, like a wild animal who's been abused by human beings. Even if you come at it with the kindest intentions, it's going to be suspicious. So you have to show yourself to be trustworthy. Listen to what the body needs right now. Gain a sense of where its most sensitive spots are and how the breath can nourish those spots, refresh those spots. And again, remind yourself, sitting here blissing out on the breath is not a selfish thing. Because if you can find well-being in here, one, you're not taking anything away from anyone else, and two, you have an inner strength your inner resources, so you don't have to go feeding off of other people, so that when the time comes to help other people, you're not coming with a sense of hunger. You're not trying to feed your neurotic needs. You're coming out of a sense of inner wealth, inner satisfaction, and that kind of help is a lot more reliable. So pay more attention the breath coming in and going out. Pay more attention to how the subtle breath energies flow in the body. 
what feels good, what doesn't feel good right now. I've often found that the area around the heart, if it's going to be open to you, can be very sensitive to the breath energy. So you try to make it open up, and then you try to provide it with the kind of breath it needs. Now, there may be parts of the body that tend to be closed off. And originally, when I was starting out meditating, the area around my heart was hard. It was as if it didn't trust me. So I focused on the area immediately around it and treated it very gently. In cases like this, you don't go barging in to straighten things out. You listen, and then try things out very gently, and then you listen again. This is in line with the Buddha's general principle for how the Dharma is nourished. He says you commit yourself to it and then you reflect. The committing means that you do what the Dharma says. You devote yourself to a particular practice, and then you look at the results over time to see if there's anything that needs to be adjusted, anything that needs to be dropped or encouraged more. You're feeling your way, because this is a practice where you are making the Buddha's instructions your meditation. He gives you the basic outlines. For your own exploration, he tells you to breathe in and out in a way that's conducive to feelings of refreshment. How do you do that? You ask yourself, where is the potential for refreshment in here? Look, listen. He tells you to breathe in ways that give rise to a sense of ease. Well, again, look, listen, where is the potential here? When there is a sense of ease, he says to think of it spreading throughout the whole body. One of the images he gives is of a bathman. In those days, they didn't use bars of soap. They would take soap powder and mix it with water, and you'd get a kind of dough, like the dough we make bread out of. So you have to mix it so the water moistens every bit of the dough. In the same way, you want the pleasure to moisten and refresh every part of your body. How do you do that? And John Lee gives some ideas. Think of the breath energy flowing, that there are channels of energy flowing through the body, out to every pore, out to the tips of every finger, out to the spaces between the fingers, the tips of the toes, the spaces between the toes. And then be sensitive, as he says, to breathing in and out, sensitive to metal fabrication. This is largely the the perceptions you use around the breath. Remember, we're not trying to pump air into a solid body. Our immediate experience of the body is breath energy. So as the breath flows in, it's simply energy mingling with energy. It flows out, it's energy draining out from energy. There are no clear dividing lines. And if there are any strong movements of energy from one part of the body to the other, think of them dispersing out so they don't get lodged or locked into a certain corner of the body. You want everything to be wide open from the top of the head down to the to tips of the toes. And indulge in this pleasure. It's one of the words the Buddha uses. We don't think of him as an indulgent type. But it is important that you appreciate the fact that you can find pleasure. The body can be bathed in pleasure, simply by the way you breathe out, by the way you perceive the breath, conceive the breath to yourself. And when you've learned how to do this, learn how to do it more and more quickly each time you sit down. Then you'll be able to have it on tap whenever you need it, because when strong sensual desires come up, you need some form of pleasure to counteract them. And this is your main medicine. This is your main alternative. So learn where your sensitive spots are. Learn how you can nourish them quickly. Keep them nourished. And then keep reminding yourself of the value of having this kind of pleasure. 
for many of us, meditation is simply one more pleasant thing to do and to add to our repertoire of things that we like to do. But you have to remember, this is the way of finding pleasure that is most moral, best for you, best for the people around you. So there are times when you want this instead of something else, because we do have to make choices in our garden of practice. We begin to realize that some of the things we pursue are like eucalyptus trees. We might like the idea that we have something exotic from another part of the world. The smell of the tree is nice, but it kills the other plants in the garden. So there are a lot of issues of pleasure in the life that are not both and, but they're either or. And you have to make a choice. As the Buddha said, when you see a greater pleasure that comes from sacrificing a lesser pleasure, the wise person would go for the greater one. And greater here doesn't mean more charged or more exciting. It means more lasting, more reliable. more ethical. This is an aspect of the meditation that people don't really appreciate. There's a moral side to meditating, that you're creating less of a burden on the world, less of a burden on the people around you. Nobody ever killed or stole or had illicit sex, lied, took intoxicants because of the pleasure of jhana. But the pleasures of sensuality are precisely the things that lead to those misdeeds. And as I said, when the time comes to be generous with other people, with your time, with your knowledge, with whatever you want to be generous with, the fact that you're coming from a sense of well-being inside means that your help to other people is not predatory. You're not helping them simply because it feels good to your self-image. You're helping them because you see that there's something that they really need and you have the opportunity and the ability to help, and you're happy to do it, because you're coming from a position of wealth. This wealth of well-being inside. So it's good all around. Good for you now, good for you in the long term, good for other people now and in the long term. And as John Mann used to say, any form of goodness that is without drawback is genuinely good. And there are so few forms of goodness in the world that are good that way. Now that you've found one of them, make the most of it. <laughs>